So welcome everybody. Uh, I'm Dr. Costantino Grasso. I'm an associate professor in business and law at Manchester Metropolitan University. And I'm honored to welcome you today to this round table in my capacity as the principal investigator of the research project, Whistling at the Fake, the crucial role of whistleblowers encountering this information. Whistling at the Fake is a multidisciplinary research project funded by the NATO's Public Diplomacy Division as part of its resilience projects. We are really grateful to NATO and its staff for supporting our research activities. Whistling at the Fake aims at addressing the gap of citizen comprehension of the forms, means, and impacts of misinformation and disinformation, as well as at empowering the public with the tools through which to identify fake news, including appropriate responses to such behaviors. Furthermore, the project focuses on the crucial role that whistleblowers and other knowledgeable insiders play in exposing misleading and hostile information activities and increasing the public resilience to acts of this nature. The battle for truth has ancient origins. Historically, we have experienced a multitude of cases when powerful individuals have abused their power or authority to silence those who dared criticize them or unveil their misdeeds. Cicero, the brilliant lawyer and greatest orator of the late Roman Republic, was caught and killed by Mark Antonis soldiers who cut off his head and the right hand and brought them for display in Rome as a sign of re revenge for Cicero's speeches and writings. Fast forward to contemporary times, there is no doubt that the struggle for truth and justice is still here. Although censorship and violence are still used to hamper the pursuit and dissemination of truth, as the gruesome murder of the Maltese investigative journalist Daphne Carana Galizia in 2017 forcefully reminds us, our democratic societies have demonstrated to be vulnerable to the subtler and more difficult to comprehend phenomena of misinformation and disinformation. The advent of the digital age has given us access to information at the touch of a button, but at the same time has also made us vulnerable to new forms and means of manipulation of truth which have far-reaching and harmful consequences for our societies. The actions of Cambridge Analytica and its undue influence on the American elections and the Brexit referendum have demonstrated how we have been caught unprepared and how dangerous this phenomenon may be, causing profound and long-lasting fractures and polarization in our society. The COVID-19 pandemic outbreak has even exacerbated such a perilous situation. Misleading information has become widespread and has affected decision-making processes by authorities and private institutions, as well as the general response of the public. Within such a grim scenario, the role of whistleblowers, leakers, and other knowledgeable insiders has demonstrated to be crucial to assist us in unveiling fake news or incorrect pieces of information or in disseminating truth that otherwise would have been deliberately shrouded in secrecy. Our research project is driven by the ambition to cast light on these burning issues. In order to achieve such an objective, we have planned a series of activities that include two international roundtables, the today's one focused on disinformation and the private sector, and the next one, which is planned for the end of February, and that will be focused on disinformation and the public sector, in cooperation with the podcast What Does It Profit and its host, Dr. Don Carpenter of Georgetown University, we are working for the production of a special edition episode focused on disinformation during the COVID-19 pandemic. We will also launch an open poster competition for undergraduate, postgraduate, and doctoral students and organize a fun and international conference in April. Please allow me now to thank, most sincerely, our esteemed and internationally renowned partners that are cooperating with Manchester Metropolitan University and actively contributing to the success of this project, including the law schools of the Boston College, the University of Padova and Tilburg University, as well as the law firms Constantin Cannon, the Center for the Study of Democracy and the Government Accountability Project. I would also like to give a special thank you to Professor Diane Ring, who is Interim Dean and Professor of Law at Boston College Law School, she has acted as a valuable mentor and advisor and will serve as the brilliant moderator of both our roundtables. The project has greatly benefited from her valuable contribution. A special thank you also to Mary Inman, partner at Constantin Cannon, 
with, who has co-organized this event and actively contributed to the, success, to the success of our initiative. Thank you also to Stephen Holden, doctoral student at Manchester Law School and senior researcher assistant at Whistling at the FIC. Finally, a big thank you to our terrific panelists and all the members of the audience that have taken the time to be with us today. I hope you will enjoy the discussion and take the chance to interact with our amazing experts asking questions through the Zoom question and answer interface. So I'm now delighted to give the floor to Professor Diane Ring, who will moderate what promises to be a constructive and fascinating afternoon of discussion. Dear Diane, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, so first, I am delighted to welcome you all uh, to today's roundtable. Um, so our topic for today across three sessions is the crucial role of whistleblowers encountering disinformation. Uh, so we're going to structure this as three uh, sessions with a short break in between. Um, the first one is exploring the phenomenon, really what are we talking about with this kind of disinformation. The second session, we'll be looking at disinformation and corporate power and wealth. And the final session, we'll be looking at uh, some special issues uh, and final recommendations with a real focus on whistleblowers. So I strongly encourage you. It's a it's a full it's a full session uh, for us across the three hours. But I really encourage you to stay through to the end because I do think um, once we build up to the discussion that includes whistleblowers, it will really be um, quite fascinating. Uh, so. I want to first go through a few quick technical details and then introduce the panel and get started. So in terms of the technical details, as I said, we'll do three, uh, do, do these as three sessions with short breaks in between. Um, in terms of audience participation, we are delighted not only that you're here, but we hope you'll uh, engage with us and do so through the Q&A function. We won't be using the chat function today, but we will be using Q&A. Um, so we encourage you to put anything uh, in there that you would like us to you know, identify, ask, address, consider. Um, just for our panelists to remind you that uh, we don't have waivers from our audience, so we won't be using their names as we answer questions. And so also, for those of you who ask a question, we won't, uh, if you're wondering why we didn't say who you were, uh, that's the reason we won't. Um, so I think we're pretty much ready to go. Um, I wanted to start by introducing the panel and really to take a moment to do that uh, in a little depth, because I think it gives you a sense of the scope of views, experience, and expertise um, that we have with us today across the three panels. So uh, just going in alphabetical order, um, Sarah Poppy Alexander. Uh, she's a partner at Constantine Cannon San Francisco office. Uh, she represents whistleblowers and government entities in key TAM lawsuits, both in federal and state court, um, as well as government entities, and works under the IRS um, and Securities Exchange whistleblower programs. Uh, she graduated from Harvard Law School, was the co-editor-in-chief of the Civil Rights Civil Liberties Law Review, uh, and an active member of Harvard's Human Rights Clinic. Um, and she holds a master's in political theory from Berkeley and a BA from Yale. Uh, next, we have with us Karim Amir. Uh, he is an Academy Award-nominated filmmaker and director, uh, The Great Hack in 2019, which he directed and produced alongside Jahani Nujim. Uh, premiered at the Sundance Film Festival. It made the Academy Award in Grierson shortlist and was BAFTA nominated, Emmy nominated, and won the Cinema Eye Award. Uh, he is currently working on a docu-series about the Lincoln Project and recently directed and produced Flight Risk, a feature-length documentary about the Boeing Mac 737 plane crashes. Uh, he's a member of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. Next, uh, we have Professor Maurizio Bianchini, uh, he is an associate professor of business law at the School of Law at the University of Padova, where he teaches competition law, IP law, comparative corporate and business law. He's the deputy director of the master's degree in international business law and a member of the teaching uh, degree in international business law where, and uh, <laughs> a member of the teaching board at the PhD school in international law, private law and labor law. He has a master's from NYU uh, and holds a diploma in English law from uh, University of Kent. And he has written numerous articles and two monograph works on business contracts and corporate law. 
Uh, Martin Bright also joins us. He is editor at large at Free Speech Magazine Index on Censorship. Uh, he was previously home affairs editor of The Observer and political editor of The New Statesman uh, and The Jewish Chronicle. He's worked with several celebrated whistleblowers, including Catherine Gunn, the Iraq War whistleblower, uh, portrayed by Kira Knightley in the 2019 movie, Official Secrets. Uh, more recently, he's worked on cases uh, with the oil industry whistleblower, Jonathan Taylor, and Apple whistleblower, Ashley uh, Jovic. He is the founder of the youth employment charity, Creative Society. Uh, next, Branislav, Dr. Branislav Hoff, a uh, senior lecturer in economic crime at the University of Portsmouth, author of Extraterritoriality and International Bribery, a Collective Action Perspective. Uh, that was 2020. Uh, he's been involved in a broad range of research activities, many of which are related to anti-corruption, transnational economic crime, and compliance. He's a founding member of the European Compliance Center and also works for a law firm uh, where he advises on various compliance issues. Uh, and he has worked as a researcher at Tilburg Law and Economic Center, uh, where he completed his PhD in anti-corruption law. Uh, Mary Inman, already referenced by Costa, uh, is a partner, Constantine Cannon's London office. Uh, after 20 plus years of representing whistleblowers in the US, she moved to London in 2017 uh, to launch the firm's international whistleblower practice. Uh, she specializes in representing whistleblowers under the American reward system. Um, and she's worked on behalf of British whistleblower, Andrew Patrick. Um, that work was featured in a recent New York Times article and her successful representation of three whistleblowers exposed, exposing fraud in the US Medicare Advantage program was featured uh, in a recent New Yorker magazine article. She's a recognized expert and uh, frequent author and speaker in areas related to both American whistleblower laws um, and the use of whistleblower laws worldwide. Next, Martin, um, excuse me, Peter Martin Jaworski. Uh, he is an associate teaching professor, teaching ethical values of business to undergraduates and ethical leadership to MBAs and executive MBAs uh, at Georgetown University. He's a visiting researcher at Brown University, uh, a visiting assistant professor at the College of Worcester and an instructor at Bowling, uh, Gre Bowling Green State University. He holds a PhD in philosophy from Bowling Green State University and a master's in philosophy and public policy from the London School of Economics. Uh, Professor Joseph McCary uh, is an academic researcher, corporate lawyer and institutional advisor. Uh, he's known for contributions in corporate uh, finance law and law, uh, European business law, financial markets, banking regulation and the political economy of federalism and taxation. As of 2015, he is a professor of international economic law and the financial market regulation at Tilburg University. Uh, also director of LLM program at the Duesenberg School of Finance. Um, during his career, he served as legal consultant uh, for the Center for European Policy Studies, Monitoring Committee for Corporate Governance, the Netherlands Ministry of Finance and the OECD. Professor Daniel T. Ostis, um, he holds the James G. Harlow Jr. Chair in Business Ethics at the University of Oklahoma. He's taught business economics, business ethics at both the graduate and undergraduate level. Uh, his research addresses the economics of marketplace ethics and the ethics of corporate legal strategy. Uh, he's the author of more than 70 scholarly articles, three books, uh, and his uh, recent work, Corporate Taxation and Social Responsibility, was published by McClure's uh, international. Uh, professor Ryan Smerick, uh, he's associate professor and associate director um, uh, in learning and organizational change at Northwestern University and the author of Organizational Learning and Performance, the Science and Practice of Building a Learning Culture, and has an active blog on research-based insights to help create positive change in organizations. He's currently researching independent thinkers, exploring questions such as why do individuals speak up, what is motivating them, and what are facilitators of effective employee voice. And finally, joining us today, Dr. Claire Wald. She's professor of the practice at the School of Public Health at Brown University. She leads First Draft, a nonprofit she co-founded in 2015. Uh, in 2009, she left her academic position at Cardiff University to develop an organization-wide training program for the BBC, on social media, verification, and misinformation. 
In 2017, she co-authored the foundational report, Information Disorder Toward an Interdisciplinary Framework for Research and Policymaking. Uh, and she's been the research director at the Tau Center for Digital Journalism at Columbia University's Graduate School of Journalism and head of social media for the United Nations Refugee Agency. She holds a PhD in communication from the University of Pennsylvania. And I just wanna say, I took the time uh, I don't normally just do that extensive a discussion of our panelists, but I really thought for today's topic, it was important to see the depth and the sort of variety of their experiences uh, and what they're bringing to the conversation today. All right, so that, that gets us into session one. Uh, and our topic, as I mentioned before, is exploring the phenomenon. And our goal in this first session is to really uh, get a handle on the scope of what we're talking about when we say uh, disinformation or misinformation and sort of the variety of, of ways that can look. And so to start us off, I thought I would invite panelists to just offer up an example um, that they think might be sort of interesting uh, that just sort of provides the audience with a sample of disinformation or misinformation. So I'll open it up and whoever might like to go first. Just, you can uh, unmute and go. I'm happy to start because I wrote a whole report about definitions. And I, I actually, I use the term information disorder because I actually think the terms mis and disinformation were kind of helpful in 2016, 2017, but the kind of things that we're talking about now are much more complex. And in fact, I also talk about malinformation, which is genuine information, which is used to cause harm. And so some people would argue that whistleblowers are malinformation. We on this panel would of course say no. Some people would say the leaking of Hillary Clinton's emails was an example of malinformation. But I don't think, you know, that the whole uh, complexity of this space means terminology is important, but I think when we consider those people who stormed the Capitol on January 6th, it wasn't, they hadn't just watched a few YouTube videos that were conspiratorial. They live in a kind of alternate reality. And this idea of, are they intentionally spreading information? So disinformation is people knowingly spreading false information. We have many people now who really believe information where we have a lot of science that says that's not true. So yes, these term, terms are important, but I think for a conversation we're having at this level, it's actually about intent, it's about format, um, and it, I think we need to get to that rather than, I mean, it's, it, you know, we're talking about media literacy, important to explain the difference, but I actually think for us, really considering propaganda, amplification of speech, targeted advertising, all of these issues are part of the problems that we're facing. And I think sometimes the, the argument can become simplified if we just use those two terms. Okay, thank you. Others, I invite you if you just even want to offer a couple of examples or... Yeah, I'll, I'll try I go next then. Um, yeah. Uh, yes, so uh, I've become very interested in how to report on uh, particularly serious whistleblowing cases in the present environment when uh, traditional journalistic models are collapsing. And, um, you know, I'm an old fashioned newspaper person. I used to work for The Observer, the oldest Sunday newspaper in the UK. And it was, you know, a relatively straightforward process uh, reporting on, on wrongdoing. Um, as the financial models of traditional newspapers collapsed, it became increasingly difficult, particularly because of uh, an increasingly uh, um, aggressive libel culture in, in the UK, which meant that the ultra rich could shut newspapers down uh, or shut the information down. Now, this led to a situation in the UK where in particular with local newspapers, um, local newspapers never run difficult stories because uh, they will never fight a libel action. Uh, and this means that really the only way of, of, um, of uh, reporting um, difficult stories is in collaboration. And the only way of working in collaboration is, is with absolutely huge stories such as the Panama Papers. So the usual um, low key stories about say, perhaps a corrupt local businessman, a small story that, that will not attract an international collaboration, never get reported. Um, but I think there's also a, 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 a new and increasingly potentially problematic situation. And I raise the 
case of Ashley Jovic, who Mary Inman uh, on this call put me on to, who is uh, probably um, is beginning to be known as the Apple whistleblower, uh, who reported on contamination of Silicon Valley. Uh, the difficulty there is that um, such is the power of Apple uh, that um, it becomes extremely difficult to for, for, for newspapers, well, newspapers and indeed news organizations to report on this, particularly as uh, a number of their tech correspondents are uh, dependent on Apple for product. Um, uh, that's one problem, but uh, uh, another problem is that I've been working on trying to get some of uh, uh, Ashley's story reported um, uh, via a documentary on Netflix. But of course, um, Netflix also has a base in Silicon Valley. Uh, the, the idea that the whole of Silicon Valley is uh, contaminated uh, affects everybody who's now trying to set up um, operations in, in Silicon Valley. So. It's a bit of a rambling answer, but I think there are a number of uh, serious concerns just about the very practice of reporting the news in the contemporary context. Great, thank you. Others have something initially you might just wanna put out there, uh, Dan. Well, I'd actually like to ask uh, uh, Martin a question if it's if it's not uh, too early for questions. But can you explain uh, a little more fully why what where the trend came from in journalism? Is it uh, is it a change in the law, or is it uh, more aggressive uh, uh, tactics on the part of, of plaintiffs, or what what changed that caused this uh, this evolution? Uh, it was um, I would say perfect storm of uh, the internet arriving and uh, attacking the very fundamentals of the of the newspaper model. Um, uh, that was one thing. So newspapers just became less um, or, or more fragile as, as institutions, certainly in the UK. Um, uh, that was then uh, coupled with um, an increasingly aggressive uh, use of uh, our defamation laws which are extremely punitive uh, we don't have the you know first amendment first amendment protections um as uh, as a journalist being um uh challenged by um someone who's uh, accusing you of libel uh, they don't have to prove anything you have to prove everything uh, and that's extremely expensive so what certain prominent libel firms extremely successful libel firms, and they do this very well in the UK, learnt, is that the way that you can close um, journalists down is simply by um, proceeding uh, prior to any court action with um, extremely aggressive threats, um, letter after letter, which the newspapers lawyers then have to answer, which is extremely expensive. Um, some people, um, some, some of the claimants uh, never have any um, intention of, of going to court. They just simply wrap newspapers, largely newspapers, um, in very expensive actions. And of course, what, what the temptation, the temptation then for, for newspapers is simply never to fight these actions. Uh, so uh, cleverly what the ultra rich realized uh, with the help of their lawyers, was that if you simply say to newspapers, I tell you what, there are two, there are two possibilities here. The first possibility is to um, fight a very expensive libel action. The second um, possibility is you simply pull everything down from your website about our client. We won't tell anyone you've done that. You don't have to tell anybody you've done that. And um, we'll all go away uh, and uh, we won't um, talk about this any further. The consequence for that, of course, for the general public is um, is silence. Um, now, um, you know, this isn't directly concerned with whistleblowers, but it does make it extremely difficult um, or more difficult for uh, newspapers to publish the claims of, of whistleblowers. Martin, that's that really help? Help? Oh. Thank Sorry, you. Daniel, did you want no, I was just saying thank you. Oh, Martin, I was just going to say, um, 
that sort of discussion, it's really interesting because it, it takes that example, it points to another part, I think uh, I was hoping we could be exploring in this first session, which is how the various examples we might imagine of problems with information, I'll do that broadly, Claire, because I'm not sure I've captured all the language, uh, but how they intersect with the legal system and where broadly where that fits in. Uh, and then also your, your, uh, your example sort of foreshadows what we'll be talking about in our second session, which is really looking at those with um, power, money, resources, and what they particularly can do in the arena of information um, and how that plays out. So that was a nice example to both sort of give us a sense of where this sessions can go and then where we'll be going in the, in the second one as well. Um, and I also just wanted to come back a moment to where Claire got us started thinking about definitions and examples. Um, and I think you, you make a point, I just want to reiterate and then, and then kind of expand a little bit in another direction, which is, um, you know, being thoughtful about how we do our definitions, even if we're still working on it, really um, can help us understand the full reach and scope of problems with information. And I think that's the real value in thinking hard about it um, and trying to uh, better understand what we're seeing. I did want to pick up, part, pick up on part and something you said, Claire, about intent, right? Those who are putting stuff out there with intent and then also amplification. Because I wondered, you know, to what degree there's a bit of an intersection um, between intent and maybe not so much intent to put out something you know is problematic. I'll put it that way, and, and then we can get into what is problematic. You you raised even the idea of things that are true but misused. Um, but people are doing that intentionally. But how much is there also a reliance on amplification from those who buy in and sort of? believe do we and, and, and is there that space of good faith um and, and so i just you know interested in any responses mary i saw you have your your uh, yeah ready to go wanted, yeah i just wanted to give an example to keep the conversation going and i would really love claire's uh dissection of this example so there's a facebook whistleblower by the name of sophie zhang um who exposed the fact that she and when she started at facebook she was very junior and she was put on a team that where all the resources for facebook and trying to deal with election uh, disinformation was focused on the major western democracies um, and she was slowly driving herself insane because she was basically given a resource starved team with very few people to deal with the rest of the world, <laughs> propaganda and disinformation in elections in the rest of the world. Um, and she very bravely resigned after trying to raise the issue and not getting any additional resources. She resigned and did, a, I think, a 30 page memo to everyone on the Apple, uh, sorry, on the Facebook listserv, explaining the situation and bringing it to light. Um, and so I think it's a really interesting example in terms of our focus today is on private uh, corporations. Like, what is Facebook's role here? They didn't, they're not the source of the disinformation. These are, you know, uh, election officials in Azerbaijan and other places. Um, but what is their role um, in, in amplifying the message and what is their role in, in actually as an arbiter of a massive platform? What, what do they need to do? Um, so I served that up to the group as a, a hypo, as red meat for us to tear apart. Yeah, I mean, we know this on this call, you know, some well-meaning white dudes in Silicon Valley had this belief that they could make some technology that was going to connect the world. And in many ways, we, many of us, got seduced by this tech utopian idea and the Arab Spring, which, of course, Kareem has torn apart. But, you know, there was we, we ourselves, I think many of us who would now see ourselves as gatekeepers, allowed this to happen. All of a sudden, Mark Zuckerberg woke up and realized that he'd created this monster. He had no idea what he was doing in the U.S. context and the English language, let alone the rest of the world. And so I think what you're saying, Mary, is when you look at where they put their resources, it is Western worlds, but it's also countries that are, you know, have regulatory teeth or are doing things that they're worried about. So, for example, uh, in 2018, they created a war room, which they brought the media to, and you saw the images, they had the Brazilian flag and the US flag for the midterms. And that was because Brazil was doing a number of things that the platforms were very concerned about. So they spend a lot of money in Australia right now, because Australia is similarly 
uh, shaking their tail. So when you look at which nonprofits they fund, and I'll put my hand up to say I run a nonprofit that has been funded by the platforms, they have funded us to do election work in France and Germany and the UK and Brazil. We tried to do Nigeria, they were not interested because Nigeria is not a country that was going to potentially regulate them. So you're absolutely right. I mean, there's so many things happening here, which is the platforms grew at scale and were just incapable of responding to the language and cultural issues that they needed to do. They should have said, we're not prepared. We shouldn't be in Myanmar. We shouldn't be in Kazakhstan. But of course, they weren't going to do that because the money was rolling in. And I don't, you know, and I do think that we have to play a part in here that we did not quickly enough say, what on earth are you doing? Because we were all kind of seduced by Silicon Valley. And I think historians will look back at the mid 2010s and say, we were asleep on the watch. And by the time we'd figure this out, the monster was too big. We didn't have any global regulatory authority that had any kind of comparative power to the platforms. And we're now stuck, no offense, having round tables. We're mad as hell, but we've kind of like, we haven't got anything that we can do. I, I mean, there's things that we are doing, but it constantly feels like we're chipping away at the iceberg. Um, and yeah, it just frustrates me that we, I think we woke up too late. Radoslav, did you have your hand up? Yes, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I am, you know, following discussion with great interest. I have two points to make. Uh, first, really, I'm really interested in further exploring uh, what I feel are two different discussions. One being looking at disinformation in terms of intentional acts, potentially applying some kind of criminological counterfraud. Uh, frameworks to look at these acts and perhaps overlaps between uh, uh, disinformation and fraud. And at the same, and on the other hand, more kind of like that corporate power and eff effect of actions that are maybe in their nature uh, truthful, but in their effect can mislead. So maybe some kind of questions of dominant position and misuse of that dominant position. So uh, just opening that as uh, kind of like a bigger topic that I'm really interested to further explore today. Uh, in the context of this discussion of uh, with some, some platform providers, I just uh, came across an interesting case, maybe just to kind of follow up on this discussion that uh, Claire and Mary just have had. Just looking into, into that case of Spotify and Neil Young's ultimatum to Spotify for Spotify kind of not doing enough to prevent misinformation related to COVID vaccines. I find it quite interesting where, uh, you know, they are just the artist wants to remove all, all recordings from that platform, which might be quite significant from the platform because uh, he's not happy. But they have been doing, and in Washington Post, on the other hand, they refer to that Spotify has removed over 20,000 podcasts, episodes related to COVID-19 in their effort to prevent misinformation. So it's just kind of provided some, some case, and it's definitely a classic topic, isn't it, going beyond, let's say, disinformation, the liability of uh, platform providers for all kind of other things too. Daniel? Yeah, I think it's uh, interesting that um, uh, Costa started with Cicero, um, because it seems like we're talking about um, uh, uh, disinformation, misinformation. It's uh, it's been with us forever. So the, and it and it has so many facets, you know, propaganda and 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 all sorts of things that come come to mind. I mean, every time there's a there's a scandal, there's a cover up. So the, the cover up winds up being disinformation. Um, and so, I mean, I, but I'm just wondering if, if um, somehow um, it's the problem of um, uh, public manipulation has become more acute just recently, um, and, and and perhaps uh, through the power of the soundbite. Um, you know, when the, the the term fake news was used so often by President Trump that it just became, uh, it's just uh, somehow has saturated the whole society where people have uh, a distrust all sorts of news sources. Um, and uh, and I guess that, that was made, that's made possible through um, the, the wide dissemination of, of, uh, of uh, images and, and the technologies that we have so that, uh, so that uh, but is this problem, uh, more acute now uh, than it has been in the past? And if so, why? I think that would be a nice thing to try to, to get a handle on over the next three hours, for, at least for me. I'll quickly say, it, you're absolutely right, it's not new. 
The thing that's new is a technology that means an eight-year-old can create a piece of disinformation in 30 seconds and it can be around the world in two minutes. So it's the, just, and the fact that that's free, the fact that you can, you can throw a ton of spaghetti at the wall and it doesn't matter, we only need that one piece of spaghetti to do the harm. So it's just the, the cost has been lowered and the amplification ability. We've always had rumors, we've always got it, et cetera, et cetera, but it was much harder for it to move beyond the village pub before. Um, and now with WhatsApp, particularly diaspora communities and everything else means it's the speed that's changed. But yeah, the, the content has not changed. And actually, uh, Dan, I, I, I thought your comment actually highlighted something else Claire said at the beginning, which is to the extent that the past two, three, four years, uh, at least from a US perspective, uh, gave a whole particular spin to misinformation through the Trump presidency. It also may have focused our attention too narrowly on the problems of information, that it's only certain kinds, you know. And so, um, you know, the, the idea that we could actually think through many other kinds of examples, not really if that ilk, Right? but that are actually really relevant in society. So if we were thinking of you know, businesses using um, non-disclosure agreements um, to prevent, say, employees or others you know, from sort of sharing information relevant to what that business has been doing uh, more broadly, um, you know, as a way to sort of think about there's just lots of spaces in which um, we may have problems with information that go beyond that. But in fact, that was so high profile in the US and so salient for so long that we may have just sort of lost track of all the other places. Um, Martin. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think what is very different and it's, it, it, it's, it's good that Claire has pointed this out is, is the role of doubt um, and the way that even the smallest um, blog or um, even sometimes the odd Twitter post can sow doubt that, that means that people struggle to grasp the truth. So, um, I mean, the example, I mean, I can give a couple of examples, but um, there's a fantastic journalist from Equatorial Guinea called Delphine Mokachi Masako, who's worked with us at Index on Censorship. He was uh, uh, someone who, whose own website did a lot to um, reveal corruption in Equatorial Guinea, which is one of the most corrupt countries in the world. Um, he had to flee to Spain eventually. Um, what the, um, the the kind of ruling family of, uh, of Equatorial Guinea then did is paid South African lawyers to set up um, uh, impressive looking um, business websites or business blogs that then trashed Delphine's reputation, suggested that he was involved with gangsters, etc. Um, uh, and it didn't matter that they these these websites were not you know um, uh, Forbes or you know they they didn't have any any authority because as soon as you search his name these stories come up and so when we as Index on Censorship are trying to do our due diligence it doesn't matter how hard you try I mean I've I've never met Delphine I've, but I have spoken to uh, people who have. Um, uh, uh, reassured me that he is who he says he is, uh, that he is indeed a campaigner against uh, against corruption in Equatorial Guinea. But nevertheless, you can't help yourself thinking, well, hang on a minute, you know, who is this gangster that he's supposed to have, uh, have been knocking around with in, uh, in, in Spain then? I mean, who are these people? Is he quite who he seems? Um, and that's something that, um, you know, obviously you could do that previously via, you know, plenty of, um, you know, a kind of um, black ops operations would try and sow doubt on, on people's bona fides, but it's incredibly easy to do that very quick. Uh, and certainly if you've got people working uh, with experience of, um, you know, search engine optimization, you can very quickly um, flip a rather obscure blog to the, to the top of Google searches and it undermines people's credibility. So that is new and that is worrying. And again, Martin, that's a nice way of showing, I think, both the intersection of technology changing things, but also how, you know, we've got, you can have issues with straight out active, you know, false information, but raising the question, 
just, you know, it, it, you know, it's so, so it's so nuanced, the range of things that really create problems with information in society, um, you know, go from the truly active falls to, you know, raising a question um, to drawing enough others in who believe you and just repeat, um, and then just go on and on from there. Um, you know, I, I wanted, I thought Kareem, I might turn to you just for a moment to sort of, you know, ask you sort of what you sort of see in terms of disinformation in the film industry. And if there's anything you'd like to begin to introduce for us there. Um, well, thank you. Uh, you know, I think that the, um, the one thing I wanted to point out is uh, in terms of what you were talking with the libel laws in the UK and how complicated they are. Uh, you know, we just saw this uh, a friend of ours, a friend of Claire Wardell's and mine, uh, Claire, uh, Carol Caldwalder, was just in the courts, you know, facing Aaron Banks, um, you know, and um, and and he, uh, it's been, it was she's you know she's she's come up on she's come out of it, but it's been really harrowing on her. Uh, it's been nerve wracking. It's been psychologically tormenting. It's been straining with her relationship with the Guardian. It, it just these kinds of tactics do work, and they do. Uh, slow people down and they do hurt our ability to do the work that we all believe is critical. And so, you know, the, the fourth estate is under assault. Um, and, and not only is it under assault, but our, the, 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 the mechanisms by which our, um, you know, the, the, the pipes, so to speak, of the free world in many way, whatever that means to any of you, but the theoretical free world that we like to kind of stare at as some kind of vista in the horizon that we all believe we somehow subscribe to, uh, those tubes are, are all clogged and, and kind of destroyed by the social media, uh, you know, fuckery basically that's happened. Sorry to, to, to kind of, I don't really know what other language to say, but when you have such a small percentage of people with the ability to do something to change this and a complete reluctance to do anything about it um, and no, you um, no, no willingness to admit whatsoever that their fortunes in Silicon Valley and the existence of Silicon Valley would not be here without the w w without this notion of the free world, without this notion of a space where freedom of expression and all these things. And so, these people in Silicon Valley are standing on the shoulders of so much pain and suffering and and human error that that happened. Uh, whatever chapter you want to kind of pinpoint on doesn't really matter. But the point is we went through hell in the 20th century to try and forge a different way. And here we are in this century, completely unaware of, 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 the, um, of, of how horrible um, the, the brunt of fascism was last century and what it caused, the wreckage it caused. So I'm, I'm extremely worried, you know, um, in terms of, uh, and I think that this kind of conversation is critical in terms of specific Stuff happening in the film industry. Um, I don't. I don't really. I, I can't point to disinformation in that way. What I can say is that the film industry is definitely not as uh, you know. It's becoming quite balkanized, right? So you can't really uh, make uh, the villain in a film be uh, you know China or <laughs> or any country where there's economic interest. Um, you know, same thing with the Middle East and other territories, you know, Netflix, uh, many of these platforms there, they're adjusting to their, you know, to their growth and, um, and they are, you know, are, are the programming decisions are no longer being made kind of for the United States as much as they used to be. And uh, I don't know if some of you saw there was a um, thing with Netflix and Russia that some people believe is quite worrisome with the Russian government and them kind of agreeing to take on a certain percentage of state um, state uh, content uh, from the government and opening an office there. Uh, so I think, you know, when, I, when we began making The Great Hack we were, we were early on, before it was focused on Cambridge Analytica, and we were looking at the kind of information space in general and kind of cybersecurity, um, everyone was concerned about kind of this balkanization of the internet, which was this era. a lot of the NATO types uh, were always, we're all talking about this balkanization of the internet that we were stepping into. 
And I think what nobody was really prepared for is that we have a balkanization within our own societies, right? Like we thought this balkanization of the information space would be happening with like, oh, there'd be like several internets, you know, the internet in China and the internet in Russia, the internet in other countries. But what we didn't really prepare for is that we would have this kind of different uh, information platforms and in different kind of instruments within our own society, with their own rules and their own um, governing systems. And I think that's what's really... Uh, uh, concerning, right? When we look at kind of these spaces like par parlor and alternate kind of spaces, um, you know, I, I don't know how we, um, I, I don't know, I, I don't want to seem hopeless, but I don't know how we can, um, can curb the situation when the private companies in the United States that have the ability to do so uh, have a leadership structure that really doesn't care. Um, and we keep making films and complaining and whistleblowers come out, but nothing really happens. So uh, I hope something does, but until then, I, I'm, I'm not optimistic. Thank you, Kareem. I, you know, um, in an effort to seem optimistic, right, as moderator, um, you know, I'm hoping that, you know, one of the things I want to come to in this session a little bit is look at, at some intersections with legal and regulatory systems as they stand. Um, and then in the next session, look a little bit more at some of the things we've already started to talk about, you know, large businesses or other actors of power or strength using various kinds of techniques, including the legal system. And then in the third session, trying to think through what are places where we could imagine sort of building um, next steps. Um, I just wanted to take a moment to, to tell, encourage our audience. We've, seen, we've already been getting some questions. That's fantastic. A number of them I think are ones probably we'll be picking up in our third section. So I may hold them till then. Um, I just wanted to let you know that if you're in the audience, the um, if you raise your hand, we actually don't, can't bring you onto the panel. So I really encourage you to put anything into the Q&A and we are monitoring it and um, are looking forward to you know, picking up those issues as we continue through our sessions. Um, you know, I thought I might, you know, kind of a little bit building uh, on part of what you were talking about, Kareem, kind of dive into um, this broader question of the relationship between all sorts of problems with information and the ways in which these problems take place. And I've mentioned sort of, you know, you, you could be, you know, actively doing something, you could lead others to do something, you could hold back information, you could silence individuals. There's lots of different um, sort of, you know, sort of active, passive, direct, indirect ways of using information. Um, I also just wanted to, to sort of highlight a, a run through a few kinds of ways we see, um, you know, information spread. And, and some of this you've all hinted at in different ways. Um, you can make a false connection between things, you know, sort of imply a connection. Um, you could actually sort of be effectively an imposter in what you're saying. You could truly make up content. It can be misleading or true, but not really uh, manipulated. And I raised that to go into my question, which is, um, you know, how do we begin to think about the legal system there, right? It is, you know, if you're doing, um, it, it, if you're engaging in these different kinds of actions, is it always fraud? You know, where is the line? When is it fraud? So when could you imagine a, a legal system sort of intervening? Um, and what are the problems with that? Why is it hard? Um, we've heard a little bit just about resources. So if the player on the other side is big and wealthy, that's just a, a, a struggle if you're um, being challenged. Um, you're the one who's trying to, you know, blow the whistle or do something. Um, but if we step back a bit, just generally in the legal system, what makes it hard to get at problems with how information is being um, used, manipulated, put out there? Could you uh, could you add one more thing just to this topic, just while you're at it? Because I think it's. Yeah. I don't know if this is for this conversation or others, but while we have this. Uh, incredible group of people in one space. Uh, you know, we've, ta I, I, we've talked about this in, in past conversations, but I haven't seen uh, something really transpire that can get out there in a big way. But I, I, I think there needs to be a, like uh, someone has to really track this, the, the kind of business model of divisiveness that it exists among so many interests and just kind of, just kind of chart out for the public, like how much money 
is being made in your society off of by so many people, so, so many companies that you know and use off of kind of uh, divisiveness, off of hate speech, off of, you know, pushing forward things that no one would really be proud to say they're a part of, right? I, I think um, unless there's an active shame, shaming that happens, you know, of holding, you know, we live in a world where people are scared of a mean tweet, right? Like companies are terrified of a mean tweet. That's how you get them, right? Lawsuits are important as well, sure. But public shaming is, is, a, is a valuable tool um, and, 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 and it is a tool that the, that, that these companies actually make money off of. If we could just track kind of how much money has Facebook and Google made off of certain types of content and certain, and, and, and how, how embedded it is into their business model. I really think that that needs to be, um, uh, a point that can be attacked from both legal and non-legal, uh, strategies. So I just wanted to add that to your, to your list. Yeah, no, that's a great addition because really it is different from some of the other things in other ways we've been describing um, sort of business incentives or behavior. So I think, you know, the idea that affirmatively benefiting from the conflict or the misinformation, divisiveness, et cetera. Great. Um, so I guess, Poppy, go ahead. Uh, sure. sure. I mean, I... I think that's a really interesting point. I know this is supposed to be the optimistic section about you know legal tools, but uh, you know businesses are not that scared of lawsuits because they know how to fight them, and they've been fighting them forever. And they have you know a, a number of lawyers lined up on the other side, knowing exactly how to fight uh, the kinds of lawsuits that we might bring. But mean tweets, you're right; they haven't quite figured out how to deal with them, and so that is scarier. Which, in you know, stepping back for a second, is in itself a, a scarier proposition. Um, you know, to to take it in a little bit more of an optimistic stance, I think you know, I think one of the struggles we deal with a lot is, at least in the U.S., we have all these different regulators who have overlapping jurisdictions. And it's hard to know who is doing what. Um, and it's it's left us with this, you know, uh, a, a big hole in a lot of the different sort of regulatory schemes that I, I have some optimism right now is starting to be filled. We're seeing, for example, the SEC starting to really come after, you know, crypto exchanges and um, other areas where there's just, uh, you know, things are sort of running wild. Um, you know, DOJ is is starting to uh, enforce priorities, but um, I I think it's a it's a problem that we have here, and of course that's only just thinking about it domestically in the U.S. You know, when you when you take it broader into an international scheme, it's a whole other ballpark. Um, so I, I think that's just one of the challenges we have to deal with. I wanted to step away from the legal for a minute and then go back to Kareem's point, which I think is really interesting is um, what are the levers that can be pulled to stop this? Um, and I think one of the most interesting ones I saw was a account on Twitter called Sleeping Giant. And I don't know if you know, it was a guy in the Bay Area named Matt Rivets. And he basically um, just through his Twitter account um, got over 4,000 companies to um, no longer advertise on Breitbart News because of the hate speech and um, bigotry that was being showing up on that platform. So I do think there's, in a way, those kinds of efforts often seem more effective than the legal channels. Um, so I don't want to limit ourselves to the legal channels because I've been very um, heartened when you feel like um, this is such an overwhelming problem and we can't do anything. And then you see individual actors using that same platform, the Twitter platform, to make that kind of change. I do think that it's important to consider uh, those solutions as well. You know, um, oh, Martin, I'll let you go. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think it's important not to... Um, dip into kind of ultra cynicism uh, so uh, tempting though it is um, I think um, uh, politi political inaction and, and progress depends on people becoming cynical um, and you know I've I've often used the example of uh, uh, 
of uh, my son and his friends who are kind of 18 years old, uh, kind of deciding that this is all, you know, all the stuff that we care about is, is just what happens and um, there's nothing you can do about it. Um, everybody's chatting shit, as they say, and um, uh, whoever you listen to, uh, it doesn't really matter whether it's, um, you know, Joe Rogan or uh, the BBC. It's all just the kind of white noise that uh, that the younger generation have have got to um, uh, have got to negotiate in their own way. Often, often in a very subjective and um, individualistic way, which of course then rather suits the the powers that be. But I think what ha- what what can happen is that you can have films like The Great Hack, which pierce through this carapace of cynicism. So that do mark a, a, a kind of paradigm shift in the way we think about things. And this is, this is what journalism should be for. Uh, this is what lawyers should be doing, is, is trying to break down this idea that, um, you know, this um, uh, new truth, this, or this new uh, untruth, this new reality that we're facing is the only possible reality. Uh, which brings me back to the Ashley Jovic case, which I think is hugely important because uh, what she has done in her, you know, in her quite extraordinary uh, uh, and courageous way is raise the question. I mean, her the headline that we used in Index on Censorship about uh, her case was Apple poisoned me physically, mentally and spiritually. Uh, and I think we do have to ask ourselves whether this is in fact what's happening across the board with these platforms. We don't really understand what they are. They're very new. We don't understand what effect they have on us uh, economically, legally, transnationally, and indeed psychologically. Um, But we mustn't give up on trying to find out and trying to reveal what this new reality is Um, because that's what journalists and campaigning lawyers and academics have always done, right? And that isn't new. You know, I was going to say just in the remarks now, it made me think that, you know, as we think about the intersection of information with the legal system or techniques and resources beyond the legal system, part of how we may imagine that and may be more or less successful depends on sort of who you're, who's, who's the problem. Is it a big company doing something? Um, Is it many individuals? right? Uh, doing something. Is it the platforms? And so just in my own mind, I was, you know, we were discussing some possibilities and thought, oh, that might work here, but not there. Um, kind of coming back a little bit to that, though, um, you know. And so can you add one thing to that as absolutely. well? Absolutely. Adding more and more. Because I think there's an important distinction to be made between like what the platforms do and what bad actors do, and then the degree to which the platforms enable bad actors and are reliant on bad actors because they actually are incentivized for those bad actors to do what they're doing. And that's the kind of big debate that still isn't uh, resolved in the Cambridge Analytica story, right? Which is like the degree to which, you know, the narrative that Facebook was very actively trying to deploy is bad people did a bad thing on our good site that's filled with all of your memories and all your things that we, you know, we would never do anything bad, as opposed to we invited a bunch of bad people to come here knowing they would probably do something that's pretty messed up, but that's okay because we didn't think it was a problem, right? Those are two very different things. The degree to which there's bad actors, there will always be bad actors. We will never live in a world where we eradicate bad actors, right? I think it's very important to, because I feel like the tech companies get away with a lot by kind of, just bl- putting their hands up and saying, well, what are we going to do? There's bad actors, there's ISIS, there's people we can't account for, you know, they're just going to be bad. As opposed to we actively, you know, allow for our vulnerabilities to be exploited because we make money off that exploit. Th- that's a different correction. And I feel like if this conversation is coming at it from a kind of NATO scaffolding of that kind of like, you know, we need to kind of look at the security risk in, in, in a dire way. And that doesn't mean we can, you know, I, I'm sorry if, I, if, if, if I'm coming across as pessimistic. I'm not pessimistic. I'm optimistic because I believe in the resilience of the human spirit. I have to, or else I wouldn't get out of bed every day. But 
um, I think it's important to to apply pressure correctly. Sorry. No, uh, Kareem, and that's excellent. And I also encourage us to kind of dig into that a bit more in the second session as we look more at sort of uh, businesses and other sort of major power players um, and, and really kind of take that question up even, even more thoroughly. Um, I guess one of the things I'd kind of lay out there is, um, and, what, and a couple of you mentioned uh, free speech, First Amendment in some other contexts, you know, examples, you know, to what extent are, um, what are the challenges is kind of going back if we're looking in the legal system and I realize well pointed out we've other, other avenues and probably one would always be wanting to look at many tools. If we're thinking roughly within the law, um, what makes it hard to get at problems with information? So one of them, you know, seems to be sort of free speech um, and reliance on that. And I didn't know if any of you had thoughts on that or other, other parts of sort of the legal framework that may um, make some of this difficult. May I address that? So uh, I think one angle to look at this is what's who is in a position to speak objectively and provide some objective picture and objective truth. Uh, here, I think the discussion becomes uh, very interesting because when we speak about bad, bad actors, we can kind of translate a discussion in the kind of criminal law and what should be and it's not uh, criminal and then kind of it's not a special problem isn't it uh, it just it has special specific features but we still can apply all kind of theories on counter fraud but then you have this more kind of challenging uh question which is is, is there some legitimate right to kind of like lobby for your interest and say part of the story and not the other part of the story and through that power kind of create an impression that there is only one alternative or some set of alternatives and not other alternatives. And I think that's become very, very interesting because there you can get in the discussion of who is in a position of power who is, has perhaps dominant position in certain situation. You can perhaps borrow some framework from antitrust law where you know it's not illegal to be in a dominant position, but you should not misuse that dominant position. And you're kind of getting to quite different discussion, I think, than uh, if we speak about some concrete kind of crimes or concrete uh, intentional or negligent acts to distort reality. Uh, we, we can go even at this last point, as far as what universities are doing. So I can be even at the stage of as a uni university scholar and I'm just getting money to research certain topics and not other topics. Uh, is this already getting us somewhere that I'm you know, objective valid, but just researching certain type of questions that big corporates want me to research and no other questions. I think you're muted, Dan. Thank you. I just wanted to give someone space to kind of, if they wanted to comment on, on Branislav's point. And actually I just want to, maybe I'll ask you a little bit more. Um, are you suggesting that law, fraud, intent has, has, is not the right space to be looking or that we should within that space narrow it by asking a little bit more about power and position? I think that these are two discussions. You can choose what to do. And I, th I think it's a more general question. You, you can fight bribery in America you know, or fraud in America more general, and you, have, you are in certain kind of framework of thinking. But then you come to Citizens United, if I refer to some you know, major, uh, major uh, decision of Supreme Court, which says you can be kind of putting unlimited funds to support certain political parties and, and, and it defines in certain way corruption. So what corruption is. So you kind of create it. So we are getting into the discussion. It's un it caused some inequality or some, some effect that is legal, but perhaps not fair or equal. And so, so I think these are two very different discussions, how to approach this topic. So perhaps whistleblow, and then the question is where did whistleblowing agenda fits in. So these are some big structural institutional problems and there are some very concrete kind of uh, intentional or negligent acts to, that kind of leads to improper advantage, for example. I wanted to kind of, and it's a little bit connected, Bronislav, to what you were saying, um, um, but we had two questions kind of come through our Q&A function that I thought I might bring up now. Um, First was, 
about conspiracy theories and just trying to sort of understand um, how they function in this space, how they take hold, um, and what that might say about how we would think about, you know, responding, what you know, in terms of society or others in the in the same space. And so I don't know if any of you want to sort of dive in with that a little bit. I'm happy to say something about this. I mean, as somebody who tracks these things, you know, we've always had conspiracy theories, but they've always very much been on the fringe. I'd say in the last two years, what's been so concerning is seeing these pretty obscure ideas move very much into large mainstream Facebook groups and other things. And I think one of the things we have to think about, about is why are these conspiracy theories taking hold in the way that they are doing right now? And it doesn't surprise anybody on this call that when the world is turned upside down, as humans, we're looking for simple explanations and we love stories. And it turns out a conspiracy theory tends to be a really good story that our brains are wired to help us make sense of the world. And so the world right now is complex and messy. We keep getting told we need to wait for more data. You know, that doesn't make us feel good <laughs> as humans. So unfortunately, these conspiracy theories give us something, give us a sense of agency, this sense of it's not your fault that the world has turned upside down. There's a secret cabal that are controlling you. And I think one thing about these discussions about technology is we have to recognize what's happening at the societal level. It's very easy to say if we just tweak the Facebook algorithm, we'll be OK. You know, the world was turned upside down in 2008 by the global financial crisis. Nothing really has changed there. We see more and more political scandals where there's absolutely no accountability for those who are crossing a line. And quite rightly, people are like, screw that. <laughs> so I think ultimately, if we're thinking about people, are, you know, more economic security, climate insecurity, their communities have changed, technology has changed, you know, in a way that we can't even imagine over the last 15 years, people are scared. And so there's this sense of like, oh, these stupid people who believe conspiracy theories. No, like we, there's a much, much bigger question here about why people are so susceptible and what's going on in society. It's just much harder to deal with those questions and much easier to think that a tweak in the Facebook algorithm will solve all of those things. So, again, not easy in these conversations because we can't we want to again, we want there to be a quick fix to say it's a whole of society response is going to take 30 years is pretty depressing. But fundamentally, the rise of conspiracy theories is telling us much more about what's happening in our societies than it is the technology. I was, oh, Mary. Yeah, I, I I wondered too, I know Diane, you've been wanting to get a little bit into the legalese of um, what is, is, ever, is all this information fraud? When do you cross a line into fraud? And I think it's important to talk about, there is a scienter element, a knowledge element to fraud. Um, so you have to look at the intent. So in, in it, it can be that you knowingly put out a falsehood and made a false statement, or you omitted a material fact that led to a false statement, or you were reckless uh, in doing so. So there is some level negligence, at least under the civil fraud statutes that we um, practice under um, in our whistleblower reward practice, there is that element of intent. So I did sort of want to lay the groundwork for at least where, where we frame it. Uh, uh, it's not negligence. Yeah. Well, and, oh, Martin. No, no, you go, you go. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, uh, clearly working for a free speech magazine, we have some interesting discussions about conspiracy theories and um, how far principles of free speech should apply to them. You know, should we allow um, in our pages the, um, you know, the, the uh, rehearsing of, uh, of conspiracy theories? Um, and, you know, there are limits to free speech, even a free speech magazine accepts that. Uh, and I think we are um, approaching the position where some conspiracy theories um, uh, approach the status of hate speech, but it's very, very difficult to say which conspiracy theories and who decides. Um, so I think, for instance, to go back to the example raised about um, Spotify and Joe Rogan, I feel very uncomfortable with the idea of trying to close down uh, those discussions of those conspiracy theories because um, because I think it's it's important sometimes to to flush out untruths uh, uh, in you know in the clear light of day. Where it becomes more difficult, I think, is is where 
uh, and we're sort of moving away from the, the private sphere here, but where um, conspiracy theories have been weaponized by bad actors or state actors. Um, and I'm thinking in particular conspiracy theories about, um, uh, about Syria, about uh, uh, whether or not certain war crimes uh, have been um, carried out by Assad or not, um, whether in fact, you know, the, the war crimes of Assad are in some way a false flag operation carried out by the CIA or others um, or Israel. I think you start to move into extremely difficult territory uh, when those sorts of conspiracy theories are, uh, are rehearsed. The, the, the difficulty is, is knowing how to deal with that. I mean, perhaps Claire has some ideas. Uh, I, I start, it starts to sort of drive you slightly crazy when you start to think about how, how, how you might want to deal with those. Um, and we've had direct experience of, of that with that particular conspiracy theory. Martin, oh, Claire. No, 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 I don't, I don't have a good answer to that, but... I think, you know, Martin's right in that many of us feel very uncomfortable about this idea of deplatforming and taking content down. What's frustrating is that we don't have good interview. I mean, in a journalism context, you know, Martin would interview a conspiracy theorist and would hold them to account and would challenge them in real time. The problem with the Joe Rogan example is he has a three hour podcast with a huge audience and allows people like Robert Malone to spout absolute known falsehoods and Joe Rogan is nodding along. So that, that's the challenge that we have is that particularly in an audio context, what does live fact checking look like? What, you know, I think we, we haven't invented the technology to allow speech, but real time counter speech. And, and that's the problem that we have in these spaces. Um, I don't have a good answer to the conspiracy. Question. But that's, that's why I keep going back to this business model, right? Because it's like, if the business, like, I mean, I think there's a difference between having a society where you are open to free speech. And I agree, you know, with, um, with what was said that like, as a filmmaker myself, I, I support everyone's ability to say really what they want. Um, that being said, I think there's a difference between having this, the range in a society to where your free speech is protected and being, you know, profiteering off of uh, things that are false. And, and, and I think may, that could be a range. I'm not a lawyer. I don't know what the implications of that are or aren't. And of course, from country to country is different. But I do think as a society, we need to look at the wreckage that's being caused as a result and the kind of culture that is allowing for a collective uh profiteering off this because i i think at the end of the day this is a capitalism problem like unless you curb the incentive that's driving all this i think we're all just kind of talking you know to ourselves with all due respect like it's like we can sit here and and hope that leaders are going to do things for the right reasons but we live in a in, in a world that is governed by financial interest like that is what that is the base operating model of most decision making and so um, unless you Hurt, you know, unless there is a business model decision, we won't see these these companies change, right? Uh, and to fix it, and 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 that's the bottom line. And what's 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 what we know is that that same business model, um, kind of like uh, in, 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 in you know. When so many of these companies want to accomplish the unbelievable, they're able to, right? Uh, we look at the incredible amount of, 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 of services and growth that they've been able to, 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 to accomplish. But I just think that's the only place I, keep, I, I see that we can keep going back to. You know? that, and Francis, you know, Francis's kind of thing about um, you know, curbing the, the new generation of top engineers and top kind of uh, employee capital and, and having that and targeting by targeting that generation, you, uh, you can start to kind of hurt some of these companies by not being as competitive uh, in their recruitment effort. I think that's, a, that's an extremely valid strategy as well. Um, and, and she's working on that pretty effectively. Dan, did you wanna? Yes, I, I just, uh, I think one frame, the one framework that I would, would naturally approach this topic with is is legal and i think mary's point of starting by saying there's got to be scienter but if you if look at the full definition of fraud it's uh it's a uh, uh intentional false statement of material fact reasonable relied upon causing injury 
and all those different elements in there are all problematic in, in, the, uh, in this disinformation uh, uh, realm. It's what's reasonably relied upon, what's a, what's a fact, what's an opinion, how, do, how it diffuses is the injury so that who has standing to, to bring the action. And then Poppy's point that there's all sorts of different regulatory a- agencies out there. You're not exactly sure who's, who's in charge of trying to, to, to police uh, uh, truth, uh, all overlaid with the problem of the First Amendment. Um, but uh, but if we have these legal tools to to and frameworks uh, to facilitate uh, organize or, and organize our thought, it's not a bad place to start uh, to try to get a handle on uh, exactly what is it that we're talking about here in terms of uh, uh, my my eyes glaze over whenever you say the word platform, um, but my but my but my eyes don't glaze glaze, glaze over when you say fraud. I understand what fraud is, uh, and if uh, if we're talking fraud. Uh, but then somehow fraud is now being facilitated because of these new techno- technologies. Um, then uh, then uh, it'd be nice to sort of keep those things organized so that I can understand what part of this is technology driven and what part of this is, is as uh, Kareem points out, just a good old fashioned greed uh, and, uh, and money orientation towards, uh, towards uh, manipulation of truth for, for self gain. And that's really great because that really brings me, I think, where I'd like to just take a moment. And there are so many threads of what we've been talking about. And I think you hit upon a number of ways in which um, they vary and differ. They're all broadly under the, what I keep thinking of as sort of an umbrella of problems with information. Uh, but how we go about addressing it, where we think the exact problem lies really depends. And it depends on so many pieces. And just to kind of hit some of those different either axes or factors, you know, we've talked about, you know, sort of putting things out there knowingly, uh, or just kind of repeating because you believe it. Conspiracy theories, which kind of have their own sort of potential origin and and driving forces. We've talked about corporations, both sort of ways in which they may be engaging in sort of questionable behavior regarding information, but it could be their own information. For example, I mentioned NDAs trying to you know, prevent people from discussing something, but it also could be platforms as businesses or other businesses who are encouraging various kinds of um, uh, information uh, and drama to be out there. Uh, and to really think about how all of those are pieces that are similar, but the ways in which they're so different. And at the end of the day, and maybe this is the most promising part. At the end of the day, there could never be the best answer for problems of information because there are so many different problems. And so it really is trying to think through in different arenas and different situations, how we might uh, imagine moving forward. Um, so I think here we are at 1119. Um, so that is just about a minute before our hour. Um, so I'm gonna close out this first panel. And again, remember the idea really just here to introduce wide ranging ideas and discussions about problems of um, information. Uh, When we return in about five minutes, um, we're gonna go to our second panel. And here we wanna focus a bit more on uh, information and then corporate power and wealth and maybe even other powerful players in the private sector and take a closer look at that. So um, take a break and come on back in five minutes. Thank you all.